Welcome to the Plain Faith Podcast, Episode 1. I fly low to the terrain a lot. I'm down like, you know, I'll be crossing a mountain ridge. I'll be at 11,500 feet. I'll be clearing the ground by like 500 feet or less. And that's, that's the way it works. The Plain Faith Podcast is a podcast about missionary aviation and the stories of missionary aviators who have taken seriously Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all nations and are using airplanes to be His witnesses at the ends of the earth. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Your host for today's show will be Jimmy Tidmore, who, in addition to hosting this podcast, is a pastor and a pilot residing with his family in what is known as the Rocket City, Huntsville, Alabama. He is very interested in promoting missionary aviation and helping prospective missionary pilots reach the mission field. And now, with these introductions out of the way, let's get started on another great episode of the Plain Faith Podcast. Welcome to the Plain Faith Podcast. My name is Jimmy Tidmore, and I am very excited to release the first episode of this new podcast about missionary aviation. In today's episode, we will be hearing from Daniel Gieslin, a pilot and aircraft mechanic who serves in Indonesia with his family. He has some amazing stories to share with us about his work there, and I know you are going to enjoy them. So without further ado, let's turn our attention to our guest today, Daniel Gieslin. Daniel, I'm very excited to have you on the show tonight, and I look forward to hearing the story about how you became a missionary pilot along with the stories of the things you have experienced on the mission field. I so appreciate you taking the time to join me. I know our listeners are going to enjoy the things that you have to share. So welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'd like to begin the show by just talking to you and learning a little bit about you, where you're from, where did you grow up and about your family and so forth. Sure. Uh, so I grew up in Ohio and, uh, my family, let's see, my dad was a pastor for a number of years growing up. My family, uh, kind of helped start a Christian school. And so I kind of grew up in, um, in going to church, being a Christian and, um, the, from there, you know, got kind of interested in mission aviation and then eventually ended up here in Indonesia. So you you grew up uh, in a in a Christian home, became a follower of Jesus around what age? It was uh, uh, it was definitely very young when I first uh, prayed and um, asked for forgiveness for my sins and uh, became a Christian. Um, but realistically, that very much became my own faith, something that I believed in personally when I was probably early junior high, you know, 11, 12 years old. Uh, that's when I really said, you know what, this this faith that my parents have demonstrated for me is something that really is important to me, and I want it to be a part of my life personally. And so that was really, though I was, I, though I definitely believe I was already a Christian, that was when it really became something very important important to me that I personally embraced uh, like wholeheartedly. Let me ask you this then, you were a Christian at a, at a young age and, and eventually that developed into a, to a call to missions. What though would you say came first, your call to missions or a passion for aviation? That's a great question. So uh, my my grandfather was actually um, in training to be a naval aviator in World War II, but because he had joined the war effort very um, late in the war, um, and he turned 18 in like 1945, I think, um, he uh, he basically the the war ended and the navy said um, I'm sorry at the time it was the army air force the army air force was like uh, we're done we don't need you you can you know be you know you can take an honorable discharge or you can do whatever we tell you to do which meant inventory and who knows where so he was like well, I'll take the discharge so he never really pursued aviation as uh, in any way beyond that but his enjoyment and passion for aviation kind of got handed down through the generation. Um, 
and so I kind of was infected by that a little bit from pretty young, but it was always like, it was always like, you know, it's the, it's the stars. They're out there, you see them, but you don't really feel like you can actually reach out and touch them. And that was kind of me in aviation. I, it was, I thought it was cool. I liked the idea, but it was like, that's definitely something for someone else. Um, be, so then becoming very seriously committed to um, to my faith and to uh, to serving the Lord with my whole life, that definitely came before a very distinct personal interest and desire to be involved in aviation. Uh, and um, it was, I loved aviation. I thought it was cool. I thought it would be something that would be neat to be a part of, but I didn't think it was for me until, um, really until I began began to feel like God was calling me to not only serve as a missionary overseas, but eventually to also be a missionary pilot specifically. And that was, that was like when I was about 12 or 13 years old, that's when I really felt like that was what God kind of focused my, um, interests towards. And that was very definitely as a result of my spending a lot of time really thinking and praying about, you know, uh, how can I serve God with my whole life? And that felt like a natural outcome of that uh, of that question. So I was interested in aviation, but I was definitely going into mission aviation because of my desire to serve the Lord. So I, you know, I, I really started praying about, you know, what, what God would want me to do with my whole life. And I felt like missions was that thing. And then I started asking the question, what in missions or how in missions will I serve? And that's when mission aviation came along as, uh, as like, this is a, a definitely a tool that I can make use of to serve the Lord, really. Very good. And, and also be involved with something that you're passionate about as well. Definitely. So, yeah, that's great. Hey, before we go on, why don't you tell me about your, your family now? I know you have a wife and, and, and three children. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So I'm married to uh, my wife, Joy, and uh, um, it's kind of a fun story how we met. I was actually already headed overseas as a missionary pilot when we actually met. I was raising ministry support at the time. But um, we have three kids, uh, five, uh, three, and just uh, 15 months. Uh, two of my children were born here in Indonesia, one, one while we were in language school, and then one while I was here working as a missionary pilot. And and then our third was born back in the U.S. on a kind of an extended furlough. So you were already headed to the mission field. Uh, was Joy looking to go to the mission field as well? So there's many ways every person can be involved in missions, and it doesn't always have to include getting on a plane uh, and going to the furthest place away from you know modern conveniences that you can find to talk to people about Jesus. It can very much be um, living right where you are and uh, welcoming uh, people from overseas into your home and getting to know them them into and, and reaching out to them and that was really where joy found herself she was full-time with InterVarsity christian fellowship when we met and okay. um and so she was already involved kind of in uh in kind of outreach uh and uh like right where she lived in new hampshire and um and so, and she actually spent a lot of time uh, interacting with uh, students from overseas who were at the school that she was working with uh, at, in InterVarsity. So we we met, and she knew like we met at a fundraising appointment. Like I was there talking to people about my going overseas with Mission Aviation Fellowship, asking them to partner with me uh, financially or through prayer. And um, we it was not like love at first sight or anything. It was kind of like oh, there's this person here, and um, through some very random circumstances, we ended up hanging out together a few days later, and then. Um, um, uh, talking on the phone a little bit. We actually friended each other on Facebook um, like after that kind of first hangout time and that's really kind of what got the ball going for like talking on the phone and so yeah we kind of sort of met online but not really. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah so it was it was definitely at a fundraising appointment. I like to say that she, it was my most successful fundraising appointment ever and I got my biggest you know ministry partner uh, right there at that uh, little that little uh, very small group of people. <laughs> That was a, a really good story, Daniel. I'm glad 
that you shared that. Now, before we move on, I, I would love to ask you one more thing, and, and that is about how you became certain that God was indeed calling you to the mission field. Could you take just a minute or two and tell us about that story? So I kind of have um, a fairly unique calling story that I don't actually expect to be descriptive of most people's experience when they feel called into missions. I already knew that I wanted to be a missionary. I, I'd actually talked about being a missionary when I was like two years old, apparently, um, but uh, according to my mother, anyway. Um, but when I started specifically asking the question, you know, and praying about, Lord, is this something, you know, what should, what would I do as a missionary? Um, I made some very specific prayers about um, about mission aviation. I said, "Lord, if you want me to serve in mission aviation, will you please provide this exp- you know this to happen or this to happen?" It was kind of like. Um, uh, it was kind of like like putting out the fleece and saying, uh, you know, Lord, I need a real clear sign if this is what you want. And to me, it needed to be clear because I was coming from a family that was very poor. Um, you know, we we were barely making it by. And the idea of going for mission aviation, I knew the training was crazy expensive. And um, there was just no way I in and of myself could actually afford to do that. So, you know, I'm kind of like, Lord, I need something clear if this is what you want me to do because I was interested but I didn't think it was possible and um, I kind of gave like two specific criteria there was like if one thing happens then yeah and if another thing happens then yeah and God did both and it was like okay I get the picture you're telling me very clearly this is what you want me to do and I don't expect most people are going to have an experience like that but that's how it happened for me and that and and it was clear to me because um, <clears throat> I asked for that specifically because I knew it was going to be so hard to to get the money for training and to go through that process, and um, and having that very very strong clarity has actually been really helpful through the years, uh, especially as I've had experiences that were really hard where I actually doubted whether or not this was like kind of the thing for me, and to know and remember like no this is this is very clearly what God has called me to do that was really neat that was that was a good thing to have in my background so that I could remember I could kind of look back and say no this is this is where God called me and this is and I know yeah no that I think that's good advice for anyone heading into ministry I know I've had the same thing where I've had to look back and say no I know that I'm called to do this because it, it does get tough at times and you need those very specific uh, s- indicators that no God had, does want me doing this, and here's why I know He wants me uh, doing this. So yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing that. Do you have any other advice that you might share with someone who's uh, listening to this who might be wrestling with a with a call to, to missions? And and is there any help that you can give them as they're kind of working through that beyond what you've already said? I think I would say. Um, I think I would say that all Christians are called by God to share love to um, to their neighbor. Like, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, you know, love God with all your height, mo- heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second most important commandment according to or according to Jesus. And so we're all called to do that. The question is how? And not everybody is equipped or able to do something like what I do where they're like going to like moving to a totally different part of the world and and living in overseas, etc. Um and so I would say, you know, we shouldn't maybe we shouldn't be asking the question uh am I called to Missions, but instead, maybe we should be asking the question, "How am I called?" And not not specifically to missions, but how am I called to be loving my neighbor? How am I called to be showing God's love to people around me? And that might mean reaching out to the neighbors who just moved in down the street, who are so very different from us. And that might mean reaching out to people that we work with on a, on a daily basis. And that might mean raising money, packing up your family, and moving to a very, very scary place, potentially, to live there and to love people around you. And so um, I would say 
let's let's ask the question how we are to serve God and the, the place we can start the easiest place to start is by praying for our um, pastors praying for the people who are leaders in our church um, praying for the missionaries who are living and working wherever they may be praying for our neighbors and then from there reaching out to people around us who especially man especially people who are coming to the US from overseas there's I, I know I live overseas. They feel so alone. They're so they're so out of their element. Everything is so different. Just reach out and be a friend. You know, say hi, help them out. You know, chat with them on the street or whatever. Um, it's not easy, but man, like they will be so grateful. I know I'm grateful when I receive that from my Indonesian neighbors. And so that's a, just a great place to start. And then as you're praying, maybe God would lead you to, um, to somewhere overseas. Don't, um, I would say, uh, uh, don't be afraid. You know, God will always be with you and he will provide. He provided for my flight training in some amazing ways. He provided um, the the opportunities that I needed. He provided me with a wife and family that I needed. And so if God is calling you to do something crazy, he's going to take care of you and he's going to be with you there through, throughout the whole process. That was an outstanding answer. I appreciate appreciate that. So let's let's talk transition a little bit to talk about your your flight training. You know, beginning yeah. with you talked a little bit about your your passion for aviation uh, and your grandfather and and how that all tied together. But when did that spark really turn into a, a flame? Maybe when did you first uh, step foot into a, a small uh, plane and, and and really begin that that passion? Um, my first ride in an airplane was in a DC-3, which, if you know anything about aviation, that's a beautiful cargo warbird from World War II era. And it was, it's a, it was a flying DC-3 being used by um, JARS, Jungle Aviation and Radio Service, which is a branch of Wycliffe Bible Translators. So that was my first flight. It was really, it was really neat experience. I actually remember very little of it because I was like nine. Um, so that was kind of my first time in an airplane and getting to, to, to fly. Um, after I knew that, after I really felt very strongly called to mission aviation, I started reading everything I could get my hands on in the way of, um, in, in the way of aviation information. So I had a magazine subscription. I had, I would go to the library every week and try to check out books about flying and about airplanes. And I would read like, you know, I read the FAA airplane flying handbook and, you know, just all sorts of stuff. Um, I knew that I was really, really focused on going to specifically Moody Aviation because kind of when I was like, okay, this is what I want to do, I asked a guy who is a missionary pilot, you know, where do I where do I go for training? And his very first answer was, you need to go to Moody Aviation. Okay, all right, sounds good. And I knew that Moody Aviation preferred their entrance, um, their new students not have any previous flight training. So I was like, okay, I can't fly right now, but that doesn't stop me from reading everything I can get my hands on. So I did that. And, uh, um, and so I, I read everything I could. I went on short-term mission trips through, uh, through high school. Um, I did an internship actually with a ministry between high school and college and then went to, went to Moody Bible Institute and then eventually Moody Aviation. And so I really started my flight training in earnest in, um, the summer of 2002 was when I started with the, was started at Moody Aviation, um, while I was actually still in Tennessee. So that was kind of the like that's kind of like the early history. I, I got to fly in little airplanes here and there through like junior high and high school, like once a year or so. Um, but I didn't really start flight training until like my third year in college. Okay. So you started at Moody and Tennessee. Did you, did you finish there? Or did you finish in Washington? 
I was in the last class to graduate from Tennessee. Uh, we found out in my first year in Tennessee that they were going to be moving the school from Tennessee to uh, Spokane, Washington, and uh, and so my class was going to be the last class. And we pretty much very literally turned off the lights as we graduated and left. You know, uh, helped pack everything up and send it to oh, Washington. Wow. Um, so that was that was kind of interesting. But um, but yes, I did my, all of my training in Tennessee. Okay. And, and, and let me get this straight. You're saying that as, as a child, your pleasure reading was the FAA airplane flying handbook, right? <laughs> I wouldn't call it pleasure reading, but yes, oh, I, everything I could get my hands on in, in, in aviation, I read that. And, uh, but yeah, definitely, um, definitely read a lot of that, uh, a lot of stuff like that, but yeah, technical stuff, um, accident investigation stuff. Yes. All that, anything I could get my hands on. Yeah, that that is passion and commitment at a, a whole new level. It almost makes you weird to be that committed to it. Oh, I'm very comfortable with the idea of being weird. All right. Very good. So what was your, your flight training experience like at, at Moody? Can you tell me about that? Sure. Um, I, uh, the first, the entire first year at Moody Aviation is all, or at the time was all focused on getting your maintenance licenses. So, um, your, just your basic aircraft maintenance license, as well as your airframe and power plant, uh, kind of add-ons. Um, so the entire first year, that was all, all we did. And, um, yeah, it was, that was a tough year. That first year, um, 40 ish hours at the school with labs extra in the evenings and lots of reading and it was it was a hard year um and then after that then it was two years of some pretty intense flight training um uh getting my private pilot's license getting my um high performance and, re and retractable landing gear uh add-ons getting a tailwheel certificate uh, getting my commercial pilot's license and instrument rating. Um, yeah, it was a very, very, very busy two years uh, in training there. And uh, But then, yeah, I graduated with about 360 hours of flight time and uh, commercial instrument rating. And uh, it was it was very difficult. It was hard, but it was good. Um, I look back on it now, and it's easy to say, oh, yeah, that was, that was, that was those were fun times. But, man, at the time, it was just a lot of work. So you, you finish with 360 hours and, uh, what did you do? You needed to build more time from there. Correct. Yes. So, so how did you, how did you go about that? Um, I been I went about it about the weirdest way possible. Um, I, uh, probably about four months before graduation, one of the, uh, flight instructors, uh, at Moody, Jay Bigley was like, um, would any of you? It was it was the beginning of a class, and he, it was just totally like a casual comedy. He's like, would any of you guys be interested in flying right seat in a King Air in Africa for like a year, and maybe get paid a little bit to live off of? Any, none of you guys are interested. Any of you interested in that? And and I'm like, me, please. <laughs> I had um I had spent a little time in Africa uh, on short term mission trips in high school, and I was like totally stoked about the idea of going to Africa. I was like, oh yeah, that's this is me. So I jumped on it immediately. And, um, <clears throat> I, um, uh, it was, uh, let's see, uh, mission aviation fellowship MAF was closing down a program in Mali and in the transition between MAF being there and the flight operations being taken over by a commercial company, there was going to be a few years there where they needed, um, where MAF was going to have a couple of pilots there and then they were going to, um, like MAF and this commercial company were kind of going to go outside of um, MAF and their own company and get guys who would fly as a first officer. King Air 200, or sorry, King Air 90 was the original plan. And uh, and I was like, oh, sign me up for that right now. And um, I had to, I had a f some student loans, but um, 
the biggest payments were actually back to Moody. They had, I had taken a student loan from Moody Bible Institute, and uh, I was able to contact Moody, and they were able to negotiate my payment uh, level a little bit so I could live off of the $500 a month that I was going to get paid. And um, and so, yeah, I mean, about, uh, about six weeks after graduation, I had gotten my multi-engine certificate, and I was on a plane headed for Africa. And in the process, I found out Actually, I'm not going to be flying a King Air 90. I'm going to be right seat in a Beach 1900. <clears throat> and then I was oh, like, what's wow. a Beach 1900? <laughs> um, found out it's a pressurized twin turboprop, uh, yeah. 19-passenger, fairly like basically a small commuter. <clears throat> and uh, and I, so I'm... I, I did some training, some typewriting stuff for for the airplane, and right around 380, 390 flight hours, I'm flying right seat in a um, in a Beach 1900 out of Bamako, Mali. So that was kind of pretty crazy, and <clears throat> I did that for a year, and uh, that was that was pretty cool. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about um, crew resource management. I learned a lot about just general com- commercial operations. I learned about how the rest of the world actually flies as compared to what Moody teaches you know um, there was a lot of interesting stuff really uh, uh, there was no autopilot on the plane so I got really comfortable flying long legs by hand and uh, and that was pretty interesting Um, and uh, a lot of guys go from uh, Moody actually to a company called Dynamic Aviation in Virginia and uh, they do they do all sorts of different stuff well I um, I uh, I was getting towards the end of my year in, in Mali, and I was like, okay, I need to apply for a job. So I applied for at a couple places, and I applied at Dynamic Aviation, and I got offered a job. And um, it was flying for a government contract in Afghanistan for six months or a year if I wanted to stay a full year. And I was like, uh... Okay, I guess. <laughs> so I went back to the U.S. for about four weeks and then jumped on a plane again and went off to Afghanistan. And I flew there. This time it was right seat actually in a King Air. Um, and I was there for uh, six months flying um, for the winter months of 2006 to 2007. Got a bunch of flight time doing that. And uh, after that, I knew I had done a lot of flying, but I needed some maintenance experience. So I did, um, I did maintenance on the road for a wildland firefighting aircraft in, um, like, based out of Nevada, but really all over the West. And I uh, spent about eight months doing that. And that's when I said, okay, I've got my experience, and I had managed to pay off almost all of my school debt. And I said, okay, it's time to apply to MAF. So. How many hours did you accumulate in Africa and at the the dynamic aviation uh, contract? Um, I did. Uh, I got about 550 hours while I was in Africa, and then about 300 ish, 350 hours, about 300 hours, I think, uh, while I was in Afghanistan. So um, went from uh, I, I went from like 300, almost 400 hours to almost 1,200 hours uh, when I applied to MAF. Okay, so what advice would you have for someone who is in flight training to become a missionary pilot or looking at flight training uh, to become a missionary pilot, looking at, at certain schools and so forth? What, what advice would you give them? Uh, sure. Um, so... Uh, I'm fairly partial to Moody Aviation. The program program in Spokane uh, looks really good. I'm not I've not been a part of that program, so I can't say specifically. But I know a lot of the people who are there instructing, and it's it seems like a great program. So if you haven't started yet, consider Moody Aviation. It's a great place to start. That being said, we're moving. In my my impression is that Mission Aviation is moving in away from the really small aircraft into really tiny airstrip kind of mode now and so really they're good training to cover what we what you need it can be had from a lot of different places I still recommend a place that's going to focus their training around um, kind of a small aircraft bush flying kind of feel um, Laterno has a program I think Prairie Bible College has a program and there's other places too um, I would I would strongly 
recommend going to somewhere like that. If you go to somewhere like Embry Riddle or you know a large um, a large aviation school that's going to like funnel you into basically try to funnel you into the airlines, while the training is I'm sure is excellent, the difficulties are the cost is crazy and you're they're going to be focused on a multi crew large aircraft kind of feel and you sp you fly a single pilot fly a small airplane very differently um, it's not that the handling of the aircraft is differently but the like the attitude kind of the mentality that you bring to the cockpit is a little bit different especially when you're going to be flying in the middle of nowhere and so if you can focus on getting into a school that will that will be um, mission or bush flying centric with their training. That's that's m very important. Uh, after that, like once you're done with school. <clears throat> um, Flight training is good. In fact, I kind of wish I had done flight instruction for a little while just to just so that I had my uh, CFI certificate. I'm not a flight instructor at all. But um, I, after that, um, broaden your view. Like look for the flight jobs that are not standard because they're going to pay better. They're going to have more interesting experiences, and um, and they're going to take you some cool places. Now. Um, um, you know, if you have a family, if you have kids, that makes things a lot harder. Me, as a single guy, traveling all over the world, flying different places, that was really cool. And it actually paid off my school that super fast. Like, it, uh, especially especially the contract job in Afghanistan really helped with the with the uh, school debt. And um, flight, instructor, flight instruction is is does not pay well unless you're in a really big flight school where it's just fly 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 a lot um it doesn't pay very well and so if you can find another type of job that will get you better pay um, but may require traveling that might be preferable but your every every person's situation is different I would not have been able to do what I did if I had been married and so um, and so like just you know b be willing to look for the unique flying jobs because they're going to be the ones that will get you the more interesting and broader experience um, but flight instruction is really useful too because it gets you exposed to it like it helps you know the material really well because you're trying to teach somebody how to do all this stuff and so it's it's very valuable but if you're looking to pay off school that fast you might need to look somewhere else so why don't we transition now and talk about where you're at now on, on the mission field tell us about the place you're serving and, and what it's like Okay. Um, I live in uh, Wamana, which is uh, on the island of Papua in Indonesia. Um, the island of Papua is the, let's see, I think it's the second largest island on the planet. Um, you'll find it just north of Australia. Um, we're on the Indonesia side, not the Papua New Guinea side of the island, and um, I fly out of a uh, about a 5,000 foot long paved runway as my home airstrip um, at about 5,200 feet, and everywhere you go in any direction, you pretty much have to go up. Um, we live in a little, in a valley in the mountains, and um, so most of my flights are 25 to 35 minutes long. Uh, I take off, climb up to cross a ridge between um, 10 and 12,000 feet, drop right back down on the other side uh, into a little uh, runway. Most of the runways we I fly to are in the range of, tw say, 1,300 to 1,800 feet long. Almost all of them are sloped. The easy ones are at 4% slope, which is like in the U.S., a one to two percent slope is steep uh, runway is steep here i mean the bare minimum we're dealing with four um one of the one of the places i go to right now um it goes up to i think it's 18 percent. so it starts at like three percent and then it goes up to 18 percent at the very end and then there's a flat parking area at the top so i you know i come into land i land and then i have to add power to get to the top of the runway and park but i don't want to be going too fast because there's a big old rock wall right off the end of the runway and if I if I go, go too fast I could run into that and that'd be just as bad as you know just about anything else so 
Um, it's it's fairly like the the runways are pretty pretty technical. Um, <clears throat> they're they're steep, they're short, they're um, they've got lots of interesting uh, things. There's no normal traffic pattern pretty much anywhere, um, and and it's all mountain flying. We've got turbulence, we've got wind, we've got uh, rain and clouds and and all sorts of stuff. And then we've got days that are just perfect blue skies and calm, and it's just beautiful. So it's kind of it's it's just it's neat. It's a very interesting place to fly. It's always different. And I, I'll tell you, for the first six to eight months I was here flying, I was pretty nervous every time I got in the plane to go. And I was like, ha, ah, ah, this is going to be interesting. Um, now I'm getting more comfortable with it, but it definitely took some time to get used to. Yeah, I bet. So, you know, in, in the U.S., we want to know how long the runway is, but, you know, it's pretty much the same landing at, at every runway, right? Uh, and, and what you're saying there, you have to know the unique features of each runway that you're going into. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me just give you an example. Um, uh, I went into a runway called Holowan uh, a couple of days ago. So um, before I went to Holowan ever, um, I went there with another pilot and I observed him do a landing and a takeoff and then observed him doing an aborted landing. And so an aborted landing here, that means um, while you're on final approach, at some point you reach the point of no return where before that you can get out of there and safely um, but after that point you have to land or you are going to run into terrain so um, I watch him do the abort like the, at the very last minute he does the abort goes around you know and you know kind of see all the hazards associated with that and then I do five takeoffs and landings myself there uh, under instruction uh, with the with the more experienced pilot kind of talk, talking me through it initially and then watching me do it on my own and then I also practice the abort procedure and that sort of thing so all of that has to happen at every single airstrip we go to there's no such thing as here's their airstrip you know directory find your runway and go like it's got all the information you need you can just go there um, we definitely have an airstrip directory of our own but um, but before we're allowed to go to any one of them, we have to be trained specifically at that runway. So <clears throat> I had that training. Now I'm coming in to land, and it's a 16% runway, and it's steady, 16% slope the whole way up, and it's rough. And so um, I, I have to line up. Um, there's no... Like there's no good um, pattern anything. I'm, I'm over the middle of a valley, and so it's like I'm over this river, and I'm at this specific altitude, plus or minus 50 feet, and I'm at my specific airspeed, plus or minus like three knots of airspeed, and then I fly my approach with a very specific rate of descent all the way down, and at some point I'm like, okay, now I'm committed, and then I can land, uh, and then you know, touch down, add power, get to the top. And so it's uh, that's kind of the the feel of the kind of the how that whole landing process works. But yeah, absolutely very specific training to be able to do that consistently and safely every time. I was thinking as you were saying this, you know, when I was a student pilot, I went to airports on my own on cross country flights that I had never been into before with anyone, and it just no big deal, right? Because it's it's it pretty much is what it is at every place and 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 so forth and and there what you're saying is before you can go into a new runway somebody has to to teach you that strip first yeah yeah now in an emergency you're allowed to do we we have a basic set of training you know for every MAF pilot so in an emergency you're allowed to land if you have to in fact i had to do that one day i was trying to get back from an airstrip and it was just r line after line after line of rain and i was just not getting through and it was kind of closing in on me and i had to make an emergency landing at a at a little run Runway. I'd never been there. It was it was paved. It was long, uh, long-ish, but like I'd never been there. I'd never been trained on how to land there, and I had to kind of I had to look at the airstrip directory and use my best judgment to get myself on the ground. Um, and so, in an emergency, absolutely we can make use of those runways. But for normal operations, not until we've been trained specifically. Yeah. So in an emergency, you can land somewhere where you don't know anything about it, but that's the only time you'd want to do it is an emergency. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that that's awesome. So 
you're in Indonesia. How did you end up there? What was the process? Did you narrow in on that? Did did MAF kind of point you in that direction? How how did that go? When I joined MAF, um, I, at the time I was single and I was looking for some kind of com- some criteria. I had flown in Africa for a little while. I had flown in Afghanistan. I had kind of a feel of like the different flight types that I could see flying overseas, and I was I was interested in flying in a place that um, where I would be uh, actively serving um, missionaries from outside of the country who were working on things like Bible translation projects, working on um, evangelism and church development projects at at different villages. I was interested in flying somewhere that was more technical, kind of like the mountain flying, short airstrip kind of feel. And so uh, as I was looking around the different places that MAF uh, operates throughout the world, I really felt like Indonesia was kind of the best fit. So when um, when I was joining at MAF, I said, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in serving in Indonesia. And at the time, MAF had needs in Indonesia, so they were like, okay, sounds good. <clears throat> um, and so that's kind of how that worked out. Um, definitely, Indonesia was not like a kind of like a calling from God kind of thing. It was definitely more like this kind of fits the kind of the areas that I really would like to be involved in as a missionary and as a pilot. And so um, it was that was more of a kind of a logical uh, kind of assessment, but um, that doesn't mean it wasn't a calling from God. I mean, God absolutely gives us our minds and our logic to be able to uh, make decisions like that. And so that's kind of how that decision came about. Was that I looked at what was going on around the world uh, that MAF was involved in, and looked at the kind of the things that I was interested in being a part of, and that's uh, and and then that's when I kind of made that decision. Yeah. I really like what you said there about, you know, God didn't have to, doesn't have to write it in the sky for it to be a calling from him. It can be your own passions, desires, uh, the things that you would like to do, the good, the things that fit well with your abilities and so forth. So yeah. Yes. God gives us our desires. He gives us our skills. And so using those skills and using those desires to make decisions um, isn't, uh, you know, assuming that they are in line with scripture and in line with what we know of the character of God, you know, following through with those as we seek to serve him and as we seek to love others, that, that, that is a valid way of hearing how God is leading us. Now, I, I I, I say, you know, that definitely needs to be in line with godly Christian counsel from wise uh, Christians around us, and that has to be in line with Scripture. We can't just say, "Oh, I feel like doing whatever." Um, we we need to stay within, you know, what 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 wisdom says through uh, our our spiritual leaders or our or our fellow Christians and what the Bible has to say. But definitely, God gives us those desires, and He gives us those for a reason. And so. Um, we can we can use that as guidance as we try to seek out God's will. So I really like what you said there about the way God uses our wills and our desires to guide us. You know, a lot of people think that God drags us kicking and screaming into ministry and into missions. And I think from what I have seen with myself and with others, more often than not, he changes our desires, he changes our will, and we end up doing what we want to do which is at the same time what he wants us to do. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I'm not going to say there's never a time when God will not lead us into something that we really didn't want to do. I know I right. definitely felt like God has led me to do things, especially when it comes to um putting down my own pride and seeking reconciliation with others or things like that definitely didn't want to do things like that but that was what I knew God would have me do because it was loving to my neighbor and so yeah definitely uh, not always but it can happen <laughs> and um, and and but yeah definitely God gives us the desires that uh, uh, to serve him in certain ways and we should listen to that so tell us a little bit more about MAF and how the role they played, how the process went with you coming on board with them 
and how do they train you and prepare you for where you're at now? Um, in order to join MAF, you have to pass a technical evaluation. Um, that's usually a couple of weeks in uh, at the uh, U.S. headquarters in Nampa, Idaho, and um, the it's uh, it's not it's not the easiest test. You you need to have you need to come to the organization with a with a basic set of skills and an ability to learn. From there, um, you. Uh, you are then invited. That's before you even join the organization. From there, or there, you are then invited to um, come to a candidacy uh, time frame in which you join the organization and you look at where MAF is serving and where the needs are. And MAF looks at your skills and personality, and you work together to come to a decision on where you're going to serve. As soon as once that's done, the very first thing you do is you raise ministry support. Um, everything that we do is MAF is nonprofit. Everything that we do and all the and the the um, expenses for covering staff living uh, overseas is all raised through uh, people who support the ministry. And so everyone goes out and they have a portion of the ministry support that we're responsible to raise as well. And so you do that. That can take a year to. It took me all like two years almost um, to raise the ministry support. Uh, once you have in that process, as you are getting to closer to being almost fully supported, um, you come back to Nampa, Idaho, and there's about a four-month training period where there's some um, training for how to live overseas and what to expect when living overseas, giving helping people have tools to be able to handle kind of the unique stresses of, of uh, moving overseas, having children overseas. Um, well, moving your children overseas or actually having kids overseas and um, and as well as like the difficulties of just you know culture and so on and as well as about three months of some pretty intensive I think actually I think it's two and a half months of some pretty intensive flight and maintenance training and that's kind of the lion's share of the of the training for uh, with aviation is that that technical orientation period where you're doing a lot of a lot of flying in in the um Treasure Valley area around the Boise Nampa um area and then uh uh they've got a bunch of like unimproved airstrips in the valley and in the mountains surrounding the valleys and then you go on like a three or four day trip up into the mountains north uh, in northern Idaho and you fly um, around the Frank Church wilderness area and oh my goodness that's some crazy flying uh, but it's it's good training in preparation for going overseas. They like to say it's some of the hardest training or flying you'll do with MAF. That's not true if you're coming to Papua but it is true for most of the rest of the world and uh it's yeah it's um it's some pretty intense training and then after that you go to language school <clears throat> and so that's kind of the training process there especially with the flight stuff talk to me now just about uh the practical everyday adjustments that you and your family had to undergo what you know what have been some of the things that have been difficult for you to adjust to moving from the u.s to Indonesia and is there some things that maybe took you by surprise that you just weren't prepared for at all yeah um, so the first thing that kind of we kind of remind ourselves at least weekly <clears throat> this isn't our country um, I'm not right here and that's a hard thing for people to remember and I don't think a lot of actually I don't think a lot of missionaries actually do a very good job of remembering because it's so easy you come in and like just the roads you know you look at the there's potholes and there's dirt and there's ditches are terrible and they're super narrow and everyone's on there walking and a scooter and and a little bicycle taxi and you got the big trucks and, and it's like guys this is chaos just make it a little bit wider paint some pretty yellow lines down the middle, drive on the uh, right hand side of the road instead of the left hand side of the road, paint some white edge lines and everyone will be the stoplights and it'll work. And it's like, no, that's, that's my Western like 
I'm right clearly mentality speaking. What I need to realize is this is their country. This is the way that this is these are the solutions that they have come up with and I need to accept that here this is what works for them and this is the right way to do it here. And um, does it, maybe it results in more accidents. Maybe it results in more people getting hurt or killed. But this is the way they've chosen to do it. This is their country and I need to let them be free to have their own country and to not be like continually under the judgment of my Western uh, ethnocentrism, really. And so that was that's a hard lesson to learn because it's it's every day it's in, like almost everything we do I have a way of doing it because I'm American and there's a different way to do it because it's Indonesia and I'm not right and they're not necessarily right but we have to work together and so learning how to how to accept that and to live with that that's that's been a tough battle like uh, with living in Indonesia living well living overseas anywhere that's something that you're going to come face to face with is realizing I'm not right, and and it's okay if they want to do things differently, and um, I need to accept their way of doing it here because this is their country. So do you have any funny stories about your transition, something to do with just a cultural difference or a language difference that caused confusion in a, in a, in a humorous way? Okay, um, when I go to the main MAF headquarters here in Papua, which is at a different city in Sentani, the guys, the, the, the Indonesian guys that we have working on the flight line there, they call me, I mean, roughly translated, it's, it's um, Mr. Grass. And, and it's because at one point in a conversation with them, I confused the words um, uh, rambut and rumput. And... Um, uh, I'm going to get it wrong right here on the podcast, and this is going to be awesome. Let's see. Uh, rambut is hair, and rumput is grass. And it, and I told them that I needed to get my grass cut, you know, rubbing my head or something like that. And they just thought that was the funniest thing in the world because I had said the wrong word. They knew I meant hair, but I had said grass, and they thought that was funny. And and so that's that's my name there. Is they they call me Grass or Mr. Grass, or they make a comment about grass, and it's just it's like okay, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was that was funny, guys. <laughs> but you know, you're go, you're going to make language mistakes. That happens, and. Uh, uh, and as long as you can laugh about it, it's it can be pretty fun. So let's transition now and talk about the airplane that you fly and, and what you enjoy about it and so forth. Sure. Um, I fly a Quest aircraft Kodiak, Kodiak 100. Um, it's a turboprop engine, a Pratt & Whitney PT-6A, um, and it's a high-wing um just a real performer. Uh, it, it looks very similar to a caravan, but it's got a bunch more power under the hood. And um, it climbs fast. It takes off fairly quickly. It lands short. It's just a nice, it's a great bush aircraft. Um, I might be also incredibly partial to it because it's got a beautiful G1000, a Garmin G1000 panel in it. So it's got like all the nice screens instead of a bunch of little gauges, little circular gauges. And, um, <laughs> Excuse me. It's just a nice plane. Um, it flies very, ni very nicely. It feels a little bit like a sports car. It's just got so much power and kind of get up and go. Um, it's got its, it's got its problems, um, particularly on the maintenance side. It, it can be. Um, it can be a little bit more, more difficult to maintain in some ways, but like in my mind, it that those difficulties are far outweighed by just the um, the amount of performance that it has. I can go into the same airstrip that we would go to with like a little tiny Cessna 206, and I'll carry out three times as much weight, uh, or in, either in passengers or or whatever. <clears throat> I just I can just carry that much more stuff. And um, and so it's a it's a fantastic airplane and um, I I love it. Uh, it's um, it's really fun to to fly. So that's kind of um, the plane that I fly and. Um, 
I do. I do have my maintenance license, so I do also help maintain it. And uh, we've got, you know, we've got a hanger here that we um, we do all of our maintenance right here. And so uh, probably once every, well, normally, right now not so much, but normally every couple of months I'll be in the hangar for a week or so, and I'll be doing an inspection on the plane and and helping uh, maintain it. And that's where we run into a few more problems because there's just a couple of things that are a little bit more maintenance intensive than say a in a caravan but it's it's just it's got so much more margin when it comes to performance that it's just way safer of an aircraft they look awesome and uh from what from what i understand is everything that you you described and more so for curiosity's sake you mentioned that you have also flown a, a beach 1900 a king air what other sorts of planes have you flown i mean what did you start with at moody and and what other planes did you fly along the way okay uh i started off in a cessna 172r so um uh it was like a 98 model cessna to uh, 172 um nice little airplane and uh you know kind of learned on that uh from there i moved up to a beechcraft bonanza i got some time in a cessna 210 um i did my tail wheel training in a cessna 185 um i did my multi-engine in a seneca i believe then i flew a king air 1900 uh or sorry a beechcraft 1900 then uh king air 200 uh, in Afghanistan. After that, uh, I kind of had a little bit of time here and there. I flew in a caravan for, you know, like 10 hours or so. Just a little bit here and there. Um, a lot of time in a Cessna 206 during the training time uh, with MAF in uh, Nampa. And then from there uh, to the uh, Kodiak uh, here in Indonesia, I did do some, uh, a little bit of like spin training, etc in um, a super decathlon and that was pretty fun it was terrifying but it was fun so i think i probably know the answer to this of all those planes that you name which one is your favorite uh the cessna 185 actually my goodness that is a plane let me tell you it is just such a great plane i love the kodiak but if i'm gonna go and fly something for myself for fun i'll take a 185 any day Okay, I thought you were going to say the Kodiak, so you surprised me. Yeah. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about how flying on the mission field differs from flying back home with regard to the, the runways. Uh, what are some other ways it's different? Well, uh, I'll just I'll just preface this conversation with um, the the reminder that Indonesia is really growing up in this area. They're moving into kind of the modern world. They're working hard on implementing rules and enforcing them to be right on par with um, kind of the way like most international aviation operates. And so this is this is changing rapidly i mean even as we speak you know yesterday i was doing some um aida level dangerous goods handling training and that's not something that's ever been a question like we've had our policies on how we handle dangerous goods but now it's like oh we have to maintain training up to an international standard to, in order to be care able to carry these things so that's that's changing and that's um and it's a great thing. That's a sign that Indonesia is really working towards, you know, being on par with uh, uh, really um, not the rest of the world, but like on on par with modern, like modern expectations. And that is so great. The downside is, is it means there's a lot of extra regulations that we have to start complying with now that we just haven't been thinking about, like airspace rules and um, and weather limitations and so on. Um, it's a great thing now uh, but it's it's a difficult thing now um, the kind of the biggest differences between the flying that I do and the flying that um, you would do say in the US is on uh, for for the first thing um, 
you you almost you you can never guarantee that you'll have radio contact with anybody um, in the U.S. I feel like you know even if you have to get on 121.5, um, you get on the radio, you can get a hold of flight flight watch, you can get a hold of the local air traffic control, you might be able to find somebody on a local um, a Unicom frequency, um, but out here uh, a lot of times you're just talking to the empty air. There's not a lot of not a lot of other um, operators necessarily or other aircraft flying and so you're kind of on your own um, we fly low or not low like I fly high 10 12 thousand feet but I fly low to the terrain a lot I'm down like you know I'll be crossing a mountain ridge I'll be at 11,500 feet I'll be clearing the ground by like 500 feet or less and that's that's the way it works you know that's how we fly um, so you're flying close to the ground we're flying in a lot of different types of weather we've had a long, like we MAF have had a long standing policy of what types of weather we'll accept and it's um, and uh, it's it's more than I think most common, uh, most pilots would accept in the U.S. or should accept in the U.S. Um, it's um, it's not unsafe but it's definitely right on the hairy edge. It's kind of like uh, let's see, I think it's class G which is one mile clear clouds we're kind of in that range, you know we stay around there, but man, you get down to a mile visibility, clear of clouds, you got nothing. If you're going 150 miles an hour, you got nothing. I mean, you're you're just you're that's just not safe. And you know, we're we're not flying to that level to the that kind of um, we're not flying to that kind of hairy edge of the weather limits, but we're but we're flying like around mountains while doing like stuff with lower visibility. You know, if I'm starting to get to the point where I've got three to five miles visibility, I'm feeling really trapped. And uh, but we do that. We 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 do have to do that sometimes. And uh, and so that's the kind of that's some things that we get into that you wouldn't normally see. I mean, and then there's obviously the types of runways we fly to. You know, uh, they're super steep. They're very narrow. One of the airplanes, one of the airstrips I land at, it's like 30 feet wide at the most is the rollable surface. Like if you get a wheel off of this 30 foot wide strip, you're going to have problems. You'll probably get stuck in the mud. You might have an accident. So we're flying on narrow runways and um, we're always in the process of working with places and saying, no, 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 you really need to fix this right now. And that's something you don't do in, a, in, in the U.S. You aren't going to have to go to the guy who's responsible for that runway and say, okay, listen, you need to widen the runway by 20 feet on each side and yeah i know that means you have to move that boulder that's the size of a house but you got to do it or else we can't come here at all or you know or again or whatever um and you don't end up having to do things like uh, just a just a few days ago I went to an airstrip and they had said they had done some work to improve it I came over and I flew over the airstrip real low maybe about 50 feet off the ground just kind of like real low nice uh, set up to be stable overflew the airstrip to inspect it it was like they've done nothing and I had to call them on the radio and chew them out and be like no 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 you can't do this you cannot tell us that you fixed the runway and not have done anything you have to repair this now now. And so, you know, we want to serve them, but they're closed. They're, we can't go back there. And it might be months or longer till we can go back there until they've fixed it. And so there's there's a lot of things that we have to have to deal with that you wouldn't deal with in the US. I fly pigs all the time. Pigs in the pod of the in the cargo pod of the Kodiak. And uh, that's just not something you run into in the US much. I mean, I mean unless you're a farmer and that's what you do, but yeah. <laughs> So, so what would you say is the most exciting part about being a missionary aviator? And, and do you have some, some good memories and some stories from the mission field that you'd like to share? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Today is Thursday. So two days ago on Tuesday, I was flying and um, I went to an airstrip called Nirgen. And there was a guy there who had um, this time of year, they're cl the people in the village will go out and they'll climb up trees uh, to harvest. I think they're looking for coconuts this time of year. Um, but people will fall out of trees. This guy had fallen out of a tree, out of a tree and they believe he 
he had broken his back and you know sometimes I hear that and I'm like uh, maybe you just want a flight maybe you're lying to us maybe there's a real problem I got there this guy was in a world of hurt uh, um, they there's like six people with him uh, like carrying him out on a blanket stretched between a couple of poles and he could not move and uh, I had to help him get settled and get um, like laid down on the floor of my plane and I had to get him kind of sort of secured and um, then I had to get the other passengers on board and I brought him back to, to Wamana to, so he could go to the hospital things like that where it's like this is very real first person I am directly helping improve the life maybe uh, I mean in this case not necessarily save the life of someone but I'm really getting to like help this help this person out who's very in a very real obvious need that's exciting to me um, when I get to fly um, a mission team into a village and they're going back to be uh, to say they're they're checking a part of a Bible translation for quality with like with their translation team things like that that's super super exciting to me um, I love being able to help meet the needs the physical needs as well as help meet the spiritual needs of uh, of these people who um, yeah, there's other people who fly out here, but um, without without us, without an airplane coming to their village, they would have no access to um, medicine, to education, to any kind of food that they don't actually grow locally, um, to you know, clothing, I mean, just basic life staples, there would be no access if it wasn't for the airplane. And so like being a part of that just means so much to me that I would get to be able to help meet real needs on a daily basis as I serve them. I appreciate you, you sharing those things with us. Let's transition now to talk about uh, struggles Certainly, life has not been roses in this whole process. There's been some difficulties and, and so forth. So tell us, beginning, like struggles you had during flight training, whether it was with a maneuver, you've mentioned how God provided for you financially, but struggles with maneuvers, struggles with, with finances, or, or maybe you even felt a check ride along the way or something like that. Yeah. Um, doing, getting my instrument rating was really hard. Um, I just had the worst time for some reason. Um, not sure if it was me, if it was my flight instructor, if it was the situation of the training. Um, but I kind of psyched myself, uh, out of being able to do well in some ways. And I really struggled through my instrument, getting my instrument rating. Um, that was, that was really hard for me. Once I got to flying instruments, you know, in bad weather, uh, in, in kind of in the real world, in real aircraft, in real, in like in, in the clouds, it was still hard, but like the struggle through the process of getting the instrument rating really ended up paying off. Like I really ended up getting some really good training, but it was, it was hard. It was a hard fought, uh, skill that I, that I had to work with. Um, there was definitely some concern about getting uh, enough money to be able to pay for flight training, but God provided for that through some really neat jobs that I was able to do, which we've already talked about a little bit, and um, and so that was that was pretty cool. Once we were overseas, actually um, learning the correct balance between work and personal health and um, family, taking care of my family, that was really hard for me. Um, um, I I really like performing well, and I really like having people approve of me. And my flight training process, once I got here to Indonesia, was really rough, um, and uh, for a lot of different reasons. And and then even once I was uh, done and uh, with my training here, and I was flying solo, um, I uh, there was just there was a lot of things. We had we had two kids in Indonesia. We had um, we moved moved three different times uh, while we were in our first like few years in Indonesia um we had uh, our, our second child when when she was born. It was a it was a pretty rough uh, birth process um, to the point that like we had a Canadian nurse who was with us at the Indonesian hospital and she was like, um, well. 
she was very displeased with how things went and and so like through she was she was a labor and delivery nurse in the, in in Canada and like the whole process she was like this was not good <laughs> and so there was a lot of things that kind of piled up and I found myself actually um, you know I, I knew something was wrong with me and I started looking around and I was like uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm overstressed maybe maybe I'm burned out so I started looking up some stuff online and it's like you know they have there's websites that talk about being overstressed and burned out and I had like every single aside from like alcohol abuse and um, and and other forms of abuse um i was like uh i was like the classic case of over of uh, burnout like just every single thing on the checklist it was like yep 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 and i was like oh i might have a problem so i started talking with management here on the program and you know talking about what to do um through the process i ended up talking with a counselor that i had visited um when I was in the U.S. and and he and he knew me a little bit and we talked and he was like Daniel, you're in the middle of a depressive episode and I was like, what are you talking about? Depression is not for people like me. I'm a tough guy, right? But we we talked things through and um and once we like once I kind of understood what we were dealing with, it was actually a huge sense of relief because it was like what I'm looking at. Um, in like the symptoms that are going on in my life, they're they're tied to a much much deeper problem than just I'm angry about a couple things and I'm tired. It's it's much much deeper than that. And there's a solution. So um, through a fairly long and painful process, we ended up going back to the U.S. for nearly two years, and we were um, we I went to counseling. We uh, were we were given a real stable positive job at the home ed headquarters in uh, or the the MAF headquarters in in Nampa Idaho I was just doing maintenance in the hangar there um, prepping planes to go overseas while I was able to go and like get some counseling and um, and I was able to recover through the through the depressive episode and um, really uh, it was really hard it was like leaving the mission field felt everything like failure I mean it really felt like failure uh, and um, it really felt like I had let down God and that people around me were going to judge me hardcore because I just clearly wasn't up to being a missionary. Like I just, I failed somehow. And, um, and that was super hard to be able to kind of like admit, no, no, this, this happened. And this is where I'm at. And this is the path that God is bringing me on. And, um, but through some like really good godly counseling, uh, with this, um, with this guy Nate Hamlin in uh, in Boise, <clears throat> and uh, through meeting with my pastor on a regular basis for a while, and I met with member care uh, and that like MAF's member care department, and um, it was a it was a process, but we we saw recovery and we saw kind of a you know a period of like some really good healthy growth for me, and um, and actually uh, I. Um, uh, I actually had a book, a couple of different books that I um, went through during this period that were incredibly helpful as well, that um, they really helped me grow spiritually to find my value as a person in what God thinks of me rather than what I can do for God. Because I really thought like, oh, I'm valuable for God because I'm a missionary. And so he clearly is going to love me as a result. And it was like, no, no, no. God loves me because I'm his child. God loves me because he created me. And God loves me because he wants to be with me and not anything about what I do. And so um, some some really good books that were really impactful during this time is the book With by Sky Jatani, um, a fantastic book about learning to live our lives with God, um, not just kind of for him or, be, you know, tolerating him and hoping that he'll bless us like a vending, like a holy vending machine or something. And then another book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by uh, Peter 
Scazzaro, um, went through both of those books with some, with, uh, with, uh, my pastor from my church in Idaho and just fantastic, um, fantastic growth period there. And then we ended up coming back to Indonesia just, uh, just over a year ago and, uh, coming back. Yeah. There are a lot of the same problems were here. Um, it was very easy to, you know, to get sucked back into the overworking kind of feel to like the performance based mentality. But because of the foundation that, you know, the, of the counseling and the, and the meeting with my pastor and these books that really helped, um, bring me to, um, like really helped me to establish what I think is a healthy lifestyle here where, um, I can walk away from stuff. I can say, no, 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 I need this time for myself. I need time for my own personal health, uh, to take care of myself. And it's, and you know, I'm not feeling burned out. I'm not feeling overtired. I'm not feeling depressed or stressed or, well, I mean, you're always stressed, but I mean like overstressed and it's, it's so neat to see that growth in my life, but my goodness, that was a hard period of, of, li- of my t- life as well. Just a hard time, but such a good time that I learned so much about God's love for me and and living with Him. Daniel, thank you so much for, for sharing that. I know that uh, someone listening to this will be greatly encouraged by, by those words, so thank you so much. How did your family and friends help, help you through that time? Well, um, interestingly enough, my wife was actually a psychology major in college. She went to Wheaton, uh, Wheaton College in Illinois, and so when, when she heard that, when she heard, when she was at the like uh, on the Skype conversation with a counselor, um, when when he said that I was having a depressive episode, and she was like, "Oh!" And all of a sudden, like this light goes on, and she's kind of like, "I don't know how I missed this," because you know she's kind of psychology background, but then she started looking at it, she's like oh yeah <laughs> this makes sense so joy was incredibly supportive like just incredibly uh helpful and like through the whole process she was very understanding you know i kind of did some crazy stuff you know uh when we moved back to the u.s i did i i did and said some things that were like i insisted on certain things like specifically um man we came we had to go back to the u.s and we had to buy a car and it was like i need a car that i don't have to touch i don't have to do anything to it for like a year that was kind of a lot to throw on a like a you know we don't have a ton of money laying around but we're going to buy this really nice car that i don't have to work on uh she was understanding like she and and her family helped out with it and they were super understanding that like you know what daniel needs to de-stress his life hardcore right now and one of the things he needs is he needs a car that he doesn't have to work on and that was it was weird like now i look at it and i'm like ah. Uh, I could have probably saved a lot of money by accepting that I'm going to have to work on a car and I'll just have somebody else do it. I live in the U.S. I can drive it over to a car store or a car repair place and have them do it. I don't have to do it myself. But it was something I needed at the time and she was super understanding. Um, I kind of went public with my depressive episode almost immediately. Um, I had a blog at the time and I talked a lot about it and we got so much support, um, from friends and family and people who support our ministry, like just super encouraging tons of emails and letters saying that they were praying for us. We had a few people stop supporting us cause we were back in the U S like sort start supporting our ministry financially because we were back in the U S but on the whole, like most like most everybody that we talked with was super supportive and, and just really encouraging. And that was a huge help. Uh, I think in the, in the recovery process that people were willing to say, you know what, we're behind you, no matter what you're going through right now, we're really 100% behind you. That's great. So would you say there's someone who has served as a mentor to you along the way, uh, whether it be with aviation or spiritually or, or, or in any way, really? Yeah. Um, I would say, um, at different periods, because I've moved so much, it's been really hard to keep up with like one specific person, but kind of each step along the way, there's been people that I've really looked up to. Most recently, it was our pastor in Nampa, Sean, uh, Pastor Sean. He's a great guy. Um, and, uh, 
I don't know why he's pastor of a small church because he's such an amazing person and such a great like he's he's his sermons are incredible and thoughtful and he's a very caring person. I just don't understand how he could be in a small how could his church could be small still, but he's a great guy and he's got a huge heart and he was a huge help for us uh mostly i think because he really connected um with me um through things that happened in his own life he understood where i was coming from and and like i mean we went to their church like we visited one one sunday right after we had gotten back and they invite he and his wife invited us over for dinner uh after church and we're sitting there talking and like one of the first things that like somewhere during the conversation He's like, would you guys like to take our our um, our our SUV and our tow behind camper and go camp in the mountains for a little while this summer? And we're like, what? You you barely know us. You're gonna lend us your car and your camper and like just let us disappear to the mountains for a week or something? And they did. <laughs> um, but I think it was because they understood where we were coming from, like the 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 hurt we were experiencing, and it was so incredible to have him there and to kind of be as a, like yeah really a mentor to kind of meet with him on a regular basis and to talk with him and and. Um, to uh, uh, to share with him, you know, the struggles that I was having, and for him to be able to really resonate with those things, goes because of experiences in his own life, and um, and it was it was it was really a positive experience. But yeah, so I mean, he's probably the most recent. There's definitely been different people along the way, but yeah, um, yeah, definitely someone I would like to see myself modeling my ministry life after would be would be him. Great. Thanks for sharing that. So do you have any final suggestions or advice or encouragement for prospective missionary pilots? I would definitely say, um, a couple, a couple of things. One is be sure of your calling, like, and, it, and it's okay to not be sure, but um, know that know that God is is going to be with you, and uh, and is with you. And as you are looking at training, um, perhaps more important than the type of flight training you're going to get is learning how. Uh, let's see, to live a healthy lifestyle. And and that sounds kind of weird, but like that was a tr- that was some training that I just I just missed. Like being able to balance um, when you get the needs of of the people around you as you attempt to serve most people who go to mission aviation are very servant oriented like very very interested in caring for the needs of other people and that can be done at the cost of yourself and that's kind of where i found myself in a lot of ways where i was very interested in like working hard to make the mission uh, to 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 meet the needs of the mission and i wasn't giving myself the room to really struggle like i it was tough. It was tough moving to Indonesia. It was tough learning the ins and outs of the organizational culture that I found myself in. It was tough learning how to deal with interpersonal relationships that were just t- hard. It, and, and I did not give myself the room to struggle with that. And I needed to give myself room to to accept that things were hard, to, um, to give myself room to really be angry about those things and to learn to forgive about those things and to move on or to address them if they needed addressed and you know i mean you can't really address the problems with like oh i don't like the way people drive here but um like to to really in in a way moving overseas is a grieving process and so learning how to um maturely deal with the emotions that you're experiencing and how to identify them and to address them in a way that's healthy is really important. Um, and I did, that was something I didn't do well. And, um, it's perhaps as important as the quality of flight training that you get, because, um, when you get here overseas, yeah, the flying is going to be crazy. Yeah, it's going to be hard, but like what sends people home from the mission field, from serving as missionary, missionary pilots specifically, is usually not the flying. It's usually the interpersonal relationships. It's usually the struggle with accepting the home culture and the ways that it is so very different. So 
learn how to deal with those things you know talk with older missionaries find a find a missionary that you can talk with and learn from them read what you can on the story there's books and books and books about missionary burnout missionaries struggling with cross-cultural lifestyle look read those those are things i did not read read those um those are going to set you up well and, and i strongly recommend emotionally healthy spirituality and with by sky jatani um those books i strongly recommend reading them because they're going to help you um dealing with the like the personal like uh the personal side of things um yeah the flying is important the training is really important where you go and who you and 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 how the train how you train um but equally important is learning how to um how to survive emotionally and culturally as you move overseas because it's hard it's tough being out here and and unless you come with a set of tools to know how to rest to know how to relax how to deal with struggles um with anger and frustration about things um it's going to be a very short trip and we're not looking to be short trips we want to we want to stay here and so be ready, you know, be ready for the struggles and and know how to, uh, how to deal with them and how to, uh, let things go. And so that would probably be the one thing I'd really encourage people that's kind of outside of the normal, what you hear is, uh, learn how to handle, learn how to identify your emotions and how to handle them. Okay. Well, I'm definitely going to take and put both of those books you mentioned in, in the show notes for, this episode and they'll be available on our, on our website. So uh, people can uh, refer to those and, and, and get a copy of those books. So thanks for sharing about those and about those struggles and how you work through them. That, that was really helpful. So is there anything else I haven't asked you about that you, you'd like to share with us? Yeah, no, I I think we've covered covered most everything. It's really fun being here and and flying overseas and and serving. Um, it changes every day. The that my experience will be far different from what um, prospective mission aviators uh, will experience. And so you know, understand what I say is a snapshot, and it'll change. <laughs> so so how just wrapping things up, how can our audience be praying for you and your family? Sure. Um, you definitely can be praying for, um, right now we have, uh, we have, uh, a number, well, we're short staffed really right now. And so there's definitely a lot of pressure to be like working super hard and working too hard really. And so, um, we need, we need new staff members, uh, here on the field. Um, and, and we've actually got it easy compared to some of the other MAF programs. So be praying that we are able to get new staff members, uh, to come, uh, to serve overseas. Um, pray for my, my family and I, um, actually, funny enough, we've all been fighting some kind of cold for like two months, and so we could really use to get better. That would be nice. Um, and uh, we're we're looking at uh, furlough coming up this December, so pray that the planning goes for that really well, and and that um, as we uh, prepared and come back to the U S for a short period that, um, we'd be able to be rested after the end of it. Cause oftentimes on short furloughs, you come back just feeling blitzed cause you've been running around visiting family and it's Christmas, you know, so Christmas is going to be busy too. So yeah, pray that they were able to plan that well so that it's a, indeed a time of rest, uh, coming up this next, this next, uh, December. All right. Well, I will definitely, include those in my my regular prayers and i'm sure other folks listening to the to the show will do uh, the same so thanks for sharing those last question how can Mm -hmm. people connect with you on social media or elsewhere to learn more about you and maybe even become a supporter of your your ministry through prayer or finances or in other ways Sure. Um, so I am on Twitter at Indo Bush Pilot, and I'm also on Instagram, also Indo Bush Pilot. Um, you can check out both of those. I've got a little YouTube channel. Uh, you just search for Daniel Geeslin, and uh, you should be able to find me. Um, and uh, we've got a we've got a little Facebook group. I think it's private right now, but I can open that up to be public. Um, but uh, I've per- perhaps uh, Twitter is the best place to find me. Um, I do a 
a fair amount on there uh, just talking about what's happening. I'll post stuff about like medical evacuations that I'm doing like right then, right there. I post a lot of pictures there and on Instagram. So those are some places. If you're interested in finding out more about MAF as an organization or how to support us, go to maf.org um, and you can find out more about MAF. You go to maf.org slash Geesland and you'll find myself and my family and there should be a link there where you can give uh, either a one-time gift or on a monthly basis and you know of course we always welcome care packages or whatever uh, and you can find out how to do that by contacting us um, my email is dgeeslin at maf.org and uh, yeah so those are those that's kind of the way you can get a hold of us Okay, great. And once again, I'll include all of that in, in the show notes for anyone interested. And let me just add that your Instagram uh, feed in particular is outstanding. I love looking at your pictures and your your videos and, and so forth. So I would highly recommend anyone listening to the this show to, to check out your Instagram. Cool. Well, Daniel, let me just say this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, and I'm not just saying that it's been really good. I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you, learning more about you, and learning more about the ins and outs of missionary aviation. Uh, you have been an outstanding guest, uh, better than I could have asked for today, and I, I'm just really happy we had this conversation. And I'm I'm also happy to know that uh, the listeners to this show have, have undoubtedly learned something from you tonight and have been encouraged by your story. So thank you so much. Uh, please stay in touch, and may God bless you and your family. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being here. God bless. Well, that's it for this episode. We thank you once again for listening. You can learn more about the podcast and subscribe to it by visiting plainfaith.com. That's P-L-A-N-E faith.com. You will also find links there to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you are interested in becoming a patron of the show, you can do that as well by visiting patreon.com forward slash plain faith. And of course, Jimmy would love to hear from you personally. So feel free to email him at jimmy at plainfaith.com or by using the contact form on our website. Until next time, remember that God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The intro and outro music for the Plain Faith podcast is a song called Chipper by Kevin McLeod. You can find his work at incompetech.com.